One of Ferguson, Missouri's well-known black activists uh, has died. We told you this on yesterday. 29-year-old Darren Seals found shot to death in a burning car on Tuesday. We most certainly do not and will not give protection to civil rights workers. The FBI in Denver, according to internal FBI recordings, or internal FBI reports and re undercover recordings, hired a convicted felon with a history of sexual assault and, and menacing with a weapon to infiltrate these groups. COINTELPRO enabled them to run a series of covert and illegal projects aimed at surveilling, infiltrating, discrediting, and disrupting domestic American political organizations. He claimed the home was bought to provide a safe space for black creativity. These are parrots that have been put in front of the Negro community by white liberals. You can't name me a Negro later who has betrayed Negroes, who, is not, who has not been endorsed, sanctioned, uh, subsidized, and supported by the white liberals. To understand the hijacking and infiltration of the Black Lives Matter movement, one must look at history. After the Allies win in World War II, the United States' populace began to look at injustices happening within their own country. Segregation laws and horrible treatment towards minorities were still prevalent even after a unified win against the axis of evil. Organizations such as the United Farm Workers, Communist Party USA, and various civil rights movements began popping up like weeds. And to a government that needed to keep the status quo, these weeds needed to be pulled. However, with the rising popularity of all these anti-establishment movements, the government couldn't risk fighting against them outright and being seen as tyrants. This led to the creation of sinister government programs such as Project Artichoke, which were created with the intent of mind controlling people for purposes of mind control and espionage. After laying the foundations of these government programs, they decided that they needed a counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO was initiated in August 1956 and aimed to disrupt and divide the Communist Party USA through tactics like anonymous calls, IRS audits, and false divisive documents. In the same year, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover expanded COINTELPRO to spy on black leaders, justifying it by accusing them of communist affiliation. The FBI closely monitored the Southern Christian Leadership Conference from its 1957 inception, targeting figures like Bayard Rustin, Stanley Levison, and Martin Luther King Jr. After the 1963 march on Washington, Hoover identified King as a major COINTELPRO target, leading to the infamous anonymous suicide letter sent to King, urging him to self-delete. According to attorney Brian Glick in his book War at Home, the FBI used five main methods during COINTELPRO. The first method was infiltration. Agents and informers did not merely spy on political activists. Their main purpose was to discredit, disrupt, and negatively redirect action. Their very presence served to undermine trust and scare off potential supporters. The FBI and police exploited this fear to smear genuine activists as agents of chaos. The other four methods of COINTELPRO involve psychological warfare, harassment via the legal system, illegal force, and undermining public opinion. The FBI also conspired with the police departments of various U.S. cities such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Philadelphia, and Chicago to encourage repeated raids on the homes of Black Panther members, often with little or no evidence of violations, which resulted in the police killing many members of the Black Panther Party most notably Chicago Black Panther Party Chairman Fred Hampton on December 4, 1969. Before the death of Hampton, long-term infiltrator William O'Neill shared floor plans of his apartment with the COINTELPRO team. He then gave Hampton a dose of a drug that rendered Hampton unconscious during the raid on his home. These events inspired the film Judas and the Black Messiah, which I recommend you guys to watch after this video. This wasn't the first or last COINTELPRO infiltrator linked to death. In a highly controversial 1965 incident, Viola Luizzo, a white civil rights worker, was murdered by Ku Klux Klansmen. The Klansmen, including an FBI informant Gary Thomas Rowe, pursued and shot at her car upon realizing her passenger was a young black man. The FBI, attempting to discredit Luizzo, spread false rumors alleging that she was part of the Communist Party and claimed that she had abandoned her children for relations with African Americans involved in the civil rights movement. Other civil rights leaders have been theorized to have been killed by informants and federal agents such as Huey Newton co-founder of the Black Panther Party, Malcolm X, and MLK Jr. COINTELPRO was allegedly discontinued in April 1971, conveniently three years after MLK's assassination. Now, of course, making a video about Black Lives Matter, we have to make the distinction of Black Lives Matter, the movement and the organization that became Black Lives Matter Global Network. The hashtag Black Lives Matter was born in July of 2013 in a Facebook post by the BLM organization's co-founder, Alicia Garza. After the death of Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman's subsequent acquittal, 
Garza stated in a Facebook post, Black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter. Other co-founder Patrice Colors recommended Garza to coin the hashtag Black Lives Matter. As the hashtag caught fire, Garza stated that cultural workers, artists, designers, and techies offered their labor and love to expand Black Lives Matter, and this eventually led them to go to Ferguson, Missouri during the chaos of an ongoing police brutality protest. One year after Patrice Colors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi formed the Black Lives Matter network off of the hashtag Black Lives Matter, a major protest would take place in Ferguson. On August 9, 2014, Michael Brown, an 18-year-old black male, was shot and killed during an encounter with Officer Darren Wilson. Officer Wilson arrived after an assault and robbery was reported at a nearby convenience store. Surveillance video, which was publicly released in the 2017 documentary film Stranger Fruit, shows Michael Brown walking into Ferguson Market and Liquor at 1.13 a.m., ten and a half hours before he entered the store for the final time. The footage shows Brown handing a young clerk a brown package, believed by the filmmaker to be marijuana, and then receiving an unpurchased package of cigarillos from the store, which he was later seen choking the clerk and taking. After the video was rediscovered and made public in 2017, some, including Brown's family, said they believed Brown had left the package there for safekeeping and later returned it to retrieve it. The store's lawyers disputed this claim by stating that the reason Brown gave this package to the cashiers was because it was unpaid merchandise that they wanted back. While investigating the area after the call-in, Officer Wilson noticed Michael Brown and his friend Dorian Johnson walking home in the middle of the street. Wilson noticed that Brown's shirt and a box of cigarillos he was holding matched the description from the robbery call, and he suspected Brown and Johnson as being involved. When he attempted to question Michael Brown, he was attacked. There was a struggle, Brown attempting and almost succeeding in gaining possession of Officer Wilson's weapon. Due to the struggle, the weapon discharged, slightly wounding Brown, who then fled. Wilson gave brief chase, firing upon Brown, ultimately shooting and killing Brown when Brown turned to confront him. After several months of deliberation, Officer Wilson was not indicted. Riots and protests broke out over the decision. The main uproar was over Michael Brown being shot as he was fleeing and unarmed. On August 12, 2014, several hundred protesters gathered in Clayton, seeking criminal prosecution of the officer involved. Protesters of Ferguson's carried signs and many held their hands in the air while shouting, Don't shoot. According to police, some protesters threw bottles at the officers, prompting the use of tear gas to disperse the crowd. The next day, a SWAT team of over 60 officers arrived at a protest demanding that protesters disperse. That night, police used smoke bombs, flash grenades, rubber bullets, and tear gas to disperse the crowd. Al Jazeera America journalists, including Ashar Karashi, covering the protests in Ferguson, were also tear gassed and shot at with rubber bullets. An officer was captured on video pushing the reporter's video camera towards the ground and dismantling their equipment. The riots gained even more attention due to the now infamous Black Lives Matter hashtag being attached to it. The following excerpt is from Alicia Garza of the BLM organization. Our team grew through a very successful Black Lives Matter ride, led and designed by Patrice Colors and Darnell L. Moore, organized to support the movement that is growing in St. Louis, Missouri. After 18-year-old Mike Brown was killed at the hands of Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson, Of course, unrest like this didn't go unnoticed by federal agencies. In 2018, documents obtained by The Intercept indicate that the FBI surveilled Black Lives Matter activists and that the Department of Homeland Security drafted a mysterious race paper. The newly released documents suggest that the FBI put resources towards running informants as well as physical surveillance of anti-racist activists. The reports and emails also suggested that FBI agents staked out the cars and residences of individuals somehow associated with the Black Lives Matter movement. On November 25, 2014, a report released in response to the request for FBI records on Black Lives Matter surveillance showed that an FBI bomb technician and another officer from an unspecified task force observed a vehicle outside a residence and gathered registration information on vehicles parked in the vicinity. The FBI agents had identified the first vehicle thanks to a confidential human source. Um, getting into this segment, uh, trigger warning for self-deletion. I'm going to censor that word for obvious reasons. Uh, and also, I just want to say that these are real people and uh, real deaths that happened in any parties that were involved or their family. Please don't go out and harass them or try to do your own sleuthing. This is just a factual timeline of the events that happened. So on that note, let's get into it. After the Ferguson protests, various protesters ended up committing suicide or were killed. On the night of Officer Wilson's acquittal, DeAndre Joshua, 20, was shot once in the head and then set on fire inside of his car. He was the only person killed during the fires, looting, and riots that night. 
The police have not named any suspects to this day, and I've said it was unclear precisely when Mr. Joshua was killed or why his body was burned. Interestingly enough, DeAndre had an identical twin brother named Dante, and both were childhood friends with the witness who was walking with Mr. Brown when he was killed, who I mentioned earlier in the video on the case breakdown, Dorian Johnson. Edward Crawford Jr. became popular during the riots due to a photo of him throwing a tear gas canister back at police during a Ferguson protest that went viral. In May 2017, he would allegedly commit suicide. According to a police summary, Crawford was in the backseat of a car with two women also in the car with him. As the car was driving through the city's Hyde Park neighborhood, the women with Crawford had recounted how he had said he was distraught over personal matters. They then heard him looking for something in the backseat, where he then proceeded to shoot himself in the head, allegedly. Edward Crawford's father, Edward Sr., believed that the shooting was not intentional but accidental. He was quoted, I don't believe it was a suicide, adding that he had seen his son two days prior to the shooting and he was in good spirits, having recently found a new apartment and training for a new job. In October 2018, 24-year-old Donye Jones was found hanging from a tree in the yard of his North St. Louis County home. His mother, Melissa McKinney's, was active in Ferguson and posted on Facebook after her son's death. They lynched my baby. However, the death was ruled a suicide. The message, which Facebook later removed, began trending on social media sites such as Twitter and Reddit, causing people online and in the community to press officials for more answers about his death. And to this day, it is still ruled as a suicide. They ain't gonna say the truth, neither way. They ain't gonna never say the truth. The fourth death was Bassem Masri, a 31-year-old Palestinian-American man who frequently live-streamed videos of the Ferguson protests. He was found unresponsive on a bus in November 2018 and couldn't be revived. Toxicology results released in February showed he died of an overdose of fentanyl. According to the New York Times, sources close to him say that he was attracted to the protests because it mirrored the Palestinian liberation movements. Unfortunately, after the protests, he became a pariah due to a lot of Arab Americans not understanding the point of the demonstrations. He had political aspirations and was planning on running for Missouri House of Representatives in 2020. Masri announced this three months prior to his death. 29-year-old Darren Seals found shot to death in a burning car on Tuesday in St. Louis. Darren Seals was the most involved out of the five and was a community organizer born in St. Louis, Missouri. He gained prominence as a leading voice in the protest following the fatal shooting of Michael Brown. Seals was a passionate advocate for justice, police accountability, and social change. His activism extended beyond the protests and he worked to address systemic issues affecting his community. Tragically, like Edward Crawford Jr., Darren Seals was also found dead in a burning car in September 2016, and his death remains a subject of investigation. A previously classified, heavily redacted FBI file shows that the agency opened a file on Darren Seals before his death. In the file, the FBI refers to Seals as a self-described revolutionary who has espoused somewhat militant rhetoric and has access to weapons. The file on Seals run over 900 pages, but around 860 of those pages were fully redacted. The remaining 45 or so pages still had significant partial redactions. Notations in the file indicate that much of the redacted text pertains to investigative techniques and procedures, as well as private information about people other than SEALs. According to the report, at one point SEALs was investigatively detained during a traffic stop conducted by police at the request of the FBI. SEALs would later refer to this on his Twitter saying, yeah, 10 detectives pulled me and my 14 year old brother over, pointed guns on us and told me choose your enemies wisely. Seals was also very outspoken in his criticism of the Black Lives Matter organization and their activists. Darren Seals frequently utilized Twitter to openly criticize the Black Lives Matter organization, accusing it of receiving substantial donations from billionaire sponsor George Soros without contributing to the Ferguson community where protests against Michael Brown's killing took place. But yeah, Black Lives Matter, Campaign Zero, all these motherfuckers, man, they making millions of dollars. They ain't talking about no little chump change. They ain't talking about no petty money. If it was petty shit, i still call them out, but it wouldn't be a big deal. Like, these motherfuckers is eating. Cars, houses. You know what I mean? They driving around in nice, nice vehicles. All up the fact Mike Brown died. And this the long, and this the long term effects of it. If they willing to keep sending our kids out every time they die for a little money, What's gonna stop these white folks, these cops? You know, what's gonna stop these people from killing these babies? Seals contended that the organization co-opted the local movement for personal, political, and financial gains, alleging that figures like DeRay McKesson and Johnetta Netta Elzey only tweeted about the community's work while collecting funds. 
His straightforward criticism underscored his dissatisfaction with what he perceived as the organization's lack of meaningful impact. Controversial black activist Tariq Nasheed posted alleged DMs with SEALs, warning him of agents and infiltrators. For the purposes of this video, I tried getting in contact with someone who had close contact with Darren SEALs and launched a movement before what we know as BLM. We used the revolution to talk about the free uh, radio and what we were trying to do for the music industry, but we also uh, used that terminology to talk about like an actual political revolution uh, where we were starting a uh, third party. Okay, and, and when you talk about the music industry, do you talk about, uh, are you talking about changing the subject matter of what's being pushed, you know, through rap music? Uh, that's actually, uh, yeah, as far as you're asking, that's actually uh, how, how I came up with the name. Uh, it's me and my best friend, uh, Malcolm, who uh, came up with the name, and that's what we were talking about, you know. And this is before we knew, you know, what was going on in the industry. We were probably either, like, probably early college, uh, just graduated high school, but, you know, we were just like, you know, how come when it comes to certain demographics, they're always putting, you know, certain... Uh, music out there, or certain images out there, um, you know, it, it, is this, you know, is this targeted? Is this, you know, designed to, you know, hold, you know, especially black people hold, hold us back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that's kind of where we came up with the concept uh, for the name. And that's kind of how, I guess, um, things started to grow. Mm -hmm. and, and how did that transfer over to your, um, to the real world activism and your uh, kind of correspondence with Darren Seals? Um, I met Darren, um, so make a long story short, like, once we, we launched on February, or sorry, um, April 20th, so we launched on 420, 2014. Um, so our, we had certain core issues that we had already agreed upon before we launched, uh, police corruption being one of those. So before, um, the Michael Brown situation, police corruption was something that was, like, in our content stream. Uh, so we had identified certain things that were going to be in our content stream. Police corruption was one of those. I'm personally a police corruption victim and even had instances, you know, starting this where I was personally affected. So, like, that was, you know, an issue for me that was just personal. And I was like, okay, like, we have this platform, we're going to cover this. Uh, because I've had situations where I didn't get justice. And I've had a situation where I got justice in the court system, but, like, basically I lost my business. I lost, like, a year of my life, like, not a year of my life, but I lost like time fighting that case. You know, I was depressed, so it was a personal issue for me. Uh, so we had been building traffic around those issues, and whenever we post them, and this is before Michael Brown, uh, they would go viral. You know, everybody would be checking them out because I guess nobody else, you know, was posting that type of content, or maybe they didn't have, you know, the same type of following. Um, so you know, we kept uh, exposing those stories, government corruption. Uh, things like that. So when the Michael Brown situation happened, I first saw it on uh, YouTube. I saw a guy on YouTube, a um, black guy with dreads, young guy, and he was just talking about, you know, they shot this team, you know, like they just killed this team, like didn't have a gun, he was unarmed. And, you know, from that, I just started researching, you know, we do, we did news anyways. Um, we, we were news aggregators to be short, but anyways, we did the news. So I started researching just because I wanted to see, you know, if it was true or not. And, you know, the more that I, I researched and looked up, I saw the first witness account, like everything matched up. Um, so I started investigating the more. And so I started looking for a witness first. Like I was brand new in, you know, news and I didn't know how things worked and that you usually can't get to, you know, a, a witness in that type of case. But I tried. And eventually that's how I came to find that Darren Seals. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, I don't know how I like first, like knew that he was connected to the situation. I can't remember if I was just asking around, but after I found him, like, he just seemed like he was connected, you know, from posts he was making and stuff like that. And then eventually, like, from trying to find out more about the situation, uh, we connected. And when we first connected, you know, I told him what we were doing in the movement. You know, he was, like, actually, like, real skeptical at first. Um, you know, like, it wasn't always, like, you know, like, we started off, like, his friends or anything like that, you know, and he's kind of... He's a kind of a just like distrusted person. Not to say that he's not, you know, a stream away or anything like that, man. I love him like yeah, guy's awesome, but uh, you know, he's a he's a distrusted guy, you know, probably from his background. So, you know, he asked me a lot of questions and eventually I just told him everything that we were doing. You know, he eventually just stopped me, like, 
mid conversation, it's just kind of like, okay, like if you're willing to tell me, you know, this much, when, you know, you're not up to, you know, some of the stuff that we found out later that some of the other, you know, people were up to. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's how we connected. And at the time, like we had, we had the traffic at the time. So there was like, there was no Black Lives Matter. Like, I, there's, you know, obviously black movements, but like, I don't feel like a lot of people had media traction, you know, and if you look at our traffic now, we don't really have a lot of traffic. So if you do have any success, you know, they try to shut you down. Yeah. Um, but we kind of had a lot of uh, media traction. So knowing our position and knowing what we were trying to do and just wanting to help, um, I would just start, you know, posting, like reposting all the live streamers, uh, staying up at night just because I knew the police were going to try to harm people, which they did. So, like, we, you know, relay those stories, and we used the hashtag, the movement. So we had all these, you know, artists, we had business people, we had content creators, writers. I mean, we had all these people that were perfect for that situation following the hashtag. So, like, we relay the information directly to the hashtag, and we could blow things up. Um, you know, Ferguson was another uh, big hashtag. Uh, but, you know, Ferguson represented, you know, their movements specifically, and then, you know, the movement was... For us, so when it comes to you know people from Ferguson, you know saying the movement like they got that from for us, you know we had already organized and then we allowed them to affiliate, you know not Black Lives Matter but the activists from Ferguson, including Darren Seals, and so Darren Seals actually ended up becoming a leader of Ferguson's movement just because he started things and organized. Mm -hmm. but he also became he also became a leader in our movement just because of, like. I mean, why, why not? You know, like once I saw what he was doing, I saw that he, he was about what he said he was about, you know, like our movement wasn't about holding people back. Our movement wasn't about like not tapping into people's, you know, talent. Like our movement was, you know, anybody who's willing to help, you know, is doing the right thing that we need all hands on deck. So he kind of just, you know, assumed a leadership position and both, you know, and that's kind of his, his personality. And, and so that's kind of how we, uh, we first connected. As far as Black Lives Matter goes, like they they obviously didn't start Ferguson's movement. Uh, they didn't show up until a month after Ferguson's movement had started and things died down. Uh, so they used Ferguson's uh, credibility uh, to try to like you know um, solicit donation money. Uh, they didn't have anything to do with starting Ferguson's movement. You know, Darren, uh, you know, was one of those people. I believe Edward Crawford who was in the picture. There was this uh, woman named Spook who actually, you know, was shot during the protest. You know, who was out there. But you can go on Darren's page and he'll show you, you know, like, these are the people who, you know, were out there originally. And I yeah. feel like Tori Russell was one of those people uh, who was originally out there. So you can, like, literally go and look up who were the first people to go out there and stand up for Michael Brown Jr., face the tanks, face the tear gas, face, face the live rounds, and all of that. So when they say that they, you know, had any involvement in Ferguson, and this is from, you know, somebody from Ferguson, right, you know, still have contact with, um, she said they showed up for a weekend. They showed up for a weekend, they had a couple of meetings, they took some photo, photo ops, and they were gone literally, you know, at the end of the weekend. But fortunately for you guys, I love you guys and I wanted to make a great video with primary sources. So I did some internet sleuthing in my mask and I found Zebediah's Hall. And unfortunately, he is a first-hand victim of federal agencies using activists as pawns to try and discredit their respective movements. COINTELPRO 2.0, he also spoke on Alphabet Boys, Trevor Aronson of the Intercepts podcast about this situation. So... I will be linking that podcast down below and I will be posting our personal convo as a full video as my first semi podcast, I guess. So enjoy. Uh, yes, uh, name is Zebedias Hall, Zeb Hall for short. Um, from North Carolina, but been living in Denver for almost 12 years. Uh, I was part of the uh, protest in the summer of 2020. Um, protests, which usually start off pretty peaceful. And over the course of time, uh, you know, violence is usually uh, uh, conducted by law enforcement to not only defame a movement, uh, to make it look bad. And in the process, they uh, work with the media to do these things as well. So being down there, um, I kind of saw a lot of everything. I wasn't in any particular group. 
I wasn't in a BLM organization. Uh, I was more so just trying to get people to work together. And over time, um, after about a month or so of protest, I believe, uh, Michael Windecker shows up on the scene. Uh, he is able to get some kind of support or respect from uh, the YDSA, Young uh, Democratic Socialists of America, which is now a defunct group in a larger scale DSA. Uh, after Michael Windecker was able to get in good with them, he was um, perceived as a positive influence, I guess, because if he was pushed by the DSA or they trusted him, everyone else thought they could trust him as well. Mm. Uh, so over time, Windecker is telling people when the cops will be somewhere, pointing out, saying, yeah, they will be over there, they will be over there. And just so happens, they're there. You know, it's almost as if he was working in cohesion with them to, uh, if not kettle people or to uh, distract from the things that are actually happening or were happening. Mm -hmm. And were there were there any signs uh, that were suspicious of him causing infighting in the group or other things besides knowing where the police would be? Uh, I think um, over time with the people he worked with, um, we were able to tell that there were disputes that just came out of nowhere. Um, it is very weird because you don't know exactly what they do behind the scenes. But over time, a lot of the either leadership or speakers, uh, black uh, leaders or speakers and some brown folks as well, were slowly castigated, uh, looked down upon, and they were labeled as snitches. And, you know, within any community, uh, either it would be the hood life or uh, any other form of law enforcement, when you're labeled a snitch, you're not uh, safe. Mm -hmm. So by alienating us as uh, snitches, it took us out of our took us out of the community so they didn't trust us as all as well and during this time he had a few people from the ydsa down there with uh microphones and some many other uh i guess uh tools to document information uh record people and none of this was supposed to be out so i believe that what we have what we realized in the documentary probably just barely scratched the surface of what really happened yeah, because when I was doing research into COINTELPRO, I, I, I've always kind of known about it, like growing up, you know, um, I was into, it's not even conspiracies at this point, it's, you know, reality, but especially around the Cold War and Civil Rights era, there was a lot of subterfuge and some of the methods are to a T what's described of what happened in the BLM uh, movements, discrediting, uh, false flags, uh, spinning of the narratives in media you know, um, undercover agents and um, false flags. That's uh, That goes with the assassination that was tied with what the informant was planning, correct? Uh, yes, the informant under the, um, uh, I guess, uh, under the authority of the FBI agent, Scott Dahlstrom and other folks as well, uh, tried to get a gentleman named Bryce Shelby and myself to assassinate the attorney general of Colorado, who happens to be a Jewish gentleman. So uh, Phil you Weiser, see all these... Right? Yes, yes. And you see all these things now about anti-Semitism, but wouldn't it be an act of anti-Semitism if the FBI tried to get two young black men to kill a attorney general who happens to be a Jewish person? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's um, a hell of a uh, something that will be a B movie, you would think, but that's not the case. And, you know, the last thing the FBI or any of these uh, surveillance agencies wants anyone to think or believe is that they're creating assassination plots and uh, violence on the ground or afar. Yeah, and that would have that would have been disastrous for the movement's optics, especially since um, that was around the time when Trump started labeling BLM and other um, civil rights or police brutality anti-establishment uh, black activists as black supremacists, uh, classing them as terror groups. So that would have been very convenient timing to uh, discredit and destabilize uh, that kind of organized movement. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think even though they could not get us to do something i mean excuse my language but niggas ain't gonna do some shit like that <laughs> yeah. uh you know so when they try to get us to do that we're like no but they told the media that they fooled a plot um and it's really terrible because bryce shelby's name is still out there and these media organizations have not backtracked anything even though they know now that this assassination plot was uh orchestrated by the federal bureau of investigations um and something else i would like to add the, um, in 2021, the first use of the red flag uh, laws was used on Bryce Shelby. And I could see how that could be a uh, political motive as well to either delegitimize the uh, movement or to uh, push some uh, personal um, 
how would I say, uh, political endeavors by the attorney general and others. And, and for me and the people watching, uh, what is the red flag? Uh, red flag law is a law that was uh, introduced by, you know, um, whatever your politics are, but more so liberal politicians. Mm. It, it, it puts in place that someone can report someone if they feel that they are having mental health issues or they are a threat to themselves or the public. And in most cases, that person, if um, the government or the courts find that they, these uh, allegations are true, they will take their gun for a year, their weapons, and they're forbidden to having those weapons. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so the first use of this was, uh, in my opinion, uh, for political purposes. And this was this actually assisted the um, attorney general who had pushed for this law a few years earlier, pushed very hard. Now we have to think... Um, I'm a firm believer that this happened over the entire country. Mm. Uh, Denver is a very small city in comparison to a Los Angeles, a New York City, uh, and many other cities I could mention. And if they did this here, it's only we couldn't even imagine what happened in those other cities. It's um, a very terrifying thing. And I think we could be looking at um, something of, um, how would I say, a government mispractice or a government corruption on such a large scale that Americans, especially black folks, couldn't fathom it. Mm. Uh, you know, so this means massive uh, levels of prosecutorial misconduct, government misconduct, uh, things that are sealed that the public is not supposed to know because the public wasn't here and across the country wasn't supposed to know the uh, extent in which the FBI conducted themselves here. So I believe it's much worse in other places, but the government is withholding that information. Shot from Sky 4, you can see the front of this building is on fire. We also know in the same area that the Max of Pawn Shop, which is a much bigger building, is on fire. An activist group. Denver wasn't the only city with informants and agitators. Many weird occurrences and federal oversteps were recorded during the BLM protests of 2020. At ground zero of George Floyd's death, Minneapolis, a protest was infiltrated by a white supremacist who was trying to discredit the protests and spark racial tensions. The man, who was nicknamed the Umbrella Man, was caught on camera carrying an umbrella and smashing the windows of an auto zone before being confronted by other protesters and fleeing. According to an article from July 29, 2020, Mitchell Wesley Carlson was accused in a police search warrant application of being a Hells Angels biker who may be the notorious so-called Umbrella Man. From the information that I've looked up about him, his name specifically, there is nothing saying that he got convicted of it or anything, and as of 2022, the FBI is still investigating into it. So it seems like this man is just some ghost figure, or at the worst was fully complacent and became an informant or was already an informant. Also, this man who is allegedly the Umbrella Man, it's still not confirmed even though we're in 2023, also had a past criminal record of an Islamophobic attack against a woman in Minneapolis and having ties with a motorcycle gang called the Aryan Cowboys in addition to Hells Angels. Regardless of this man's origin or identity though, investigators and protesters alike both attribute the escalation and violence to people like Umbrella Man, who showed up to these movements in order to create violence and discredit peaceful protests. Of course, this is one incident, but with everything I've mentioned so far, it makes you wonder how many saboteurs didn't get caught. At the time of the riots, various protesters would post on Twitter suspicious people in protests wearing vests under their clothes, having handcuffs, or other behaviors and characteristics people would consider undercover feds to have. People reported similar happenings in surveillance around the time of Occupy Wall Street, which was later to have been confirmed to be sabotaged and surveilled by the U.S. government. On October 29th, an FBI special agent and a local police officer assigned to the task force knocked on the door of Katie Ryder, chief of staff to Democratic State Senator Rosemary Byer. They told her that they had received a report about an online conversation that Ryder had participated in from her home 10 days earlier. This online conversation was a private Zoom call about restricting the use of tear gas on protesters. The agent and officer then pressed her to answer questions about the bill's substance and timing even after she had told him what her job was and repeatedly warned the content of the draft legislation was confidential. Writers said that the FBI's visit left her confused and fearful and that it impacted the topics she talks about with people. She was also quoted saying to The Intercept that it was like they were purposefully intimidating people just to scare them, to keep them from protesting. COINTELPRO's method of discrediting, sabotaging, and surveilling racial and progressive movements seemed to have worked in the case of BLM. But while all of this aforementioned chaos was happening, what were the most famous figureheads of BLM organization doing? 
My name is Patrice Colors. I'm an artist and a community organizer. And my piece that I am bringing to Freeze is called Fuck White Supremacy, Let's Get Free. And it's a durational piece doing an hour of the electric slide, inviting all the Freeze participants um, to come and dance and hang out. And I really created this piece last year in response to um, wit witnessing the babies at the borders being detained. The mainstream commercialization of the Black Lives Matter movement has raised concerns about the dilution of its core message and the commodification of social justice. While the movement initially emerged as a grassroots response to systemic racism and police brutality, it has increasingly faced criticism for being co-opted by commercial interests and other groups seeking to capitalize on its momentum. The increase in BLM-themed merchandise and corporate endorsements has led to skepticism about the authenticity of the activism involved, as some argue that genuine change is being overshadowed by profit motives, virtue signals and two-faced support from the politicians they demand change from. Moreover, revelations about billionaire donors contributing substantial amounts to the BLM organization have further fueled debates about the movement's independence and the potential influence of wealthy individuals on its agenda. The co-founders buying mansions for black artists and creators sparked outrage, and Facebook was found to ban people from sharing articles about it and calling them out. Around the time of the Ferguson protests, the Black Lives Matter Global Network also received criticism for trying to branch away from police reform. They claimed the slogan protected LGBT TQ black lives, immigrant black lives, black women, and all black people, not just victims of police brutality. People, including Darren Seals, saw this as a hijacking of the original message and fragmented the movement with intersectionality and identity politics. Darren Seals tweeted, Before the media and BLM came in and divided us, nobody in Ferguson cared if you were gay, straight, man, or woman. It was just black unity. Founder Patrice Colors also stated that she and co-founder Alicia Garza were trained Marxists in a 2015 interview that resurfaced in 2020. Um, myself. And Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, in a now deleted portion from the foundation's website, they stated to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. Of course, having all these buzzwords and a lack of clear mission alienated and scared off a lot of people and led to the phrase Black Lives Matter, leaving a bad taste in a lot of mouths. All in all, the echoes of COINTELPRO's subversive tactics were weaponized against the Black Lives Matter movement and reveals a troubling history of systemic efforts to undermine organic activism and disrupt progress towards social and economic justice. The mainstream organization of the message selling out, along with intimidation tactics and silencing of potential leaders and activists, allowed for external influences to distort and sabotage its goals. The consequences of such actions extend beyond individual actors and impact the broader image of black protesters in their collective struggle for equality. With all of this being said, it's best to acknowledge the intention of the original message of BLM, which emerged from genuine calls for justice and police reform. Moving forward, it is crucial for activists and supporters to navigate these challenges with transparency, resilience, and a commitment to the fundamental principles that sparked the movement in the first place. Do not let anyone intimidate you or lead you astray. Only by learning from the past can movements forge a path forward that withstands external pressures and continue to fight against systemic racism and injustice. And the wise words of Malcolm X, a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything.